I want to uh, introduce uh, Chris Pham. Uh, we're very fortunate to uh, have him uh, travel here. He's the VP of uh, Bioelectronics at GSK. Um, I saw you got your PhD in molecular um, uh, biology, and I don't know exactly when, but joined GSK in 2009. So I'm not sure exactly when he moved from the dark side of drugs to uh, electrons, which most of us here in this room love, um, but at some point really has become the, uh, the industry leader in this area of bioelectronics, and, and uh, we're very fortunate to have him, doubly fortunate because in about, I don't know, 48 hours or so, it'll, it won't say GSK anymore, it'll say uh, Galvani, pending uh, probably a thousand lawyers signing off on something. So uh, anyway, it's uh, a great that we were able to get him at this point in time. So. I'll turn things over to Chris. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for inviting me. Delighted to be here. Thanks, everyone, for being flexible and uh, joining in your lunch. Uh, and also, I hear that these seminars are almost always on a Friday. So it, uh, I, I realized it was uh, some special accommodation here to, to fit this in, in on a Monday, which I really appreciate. Um, I also want to introduce my colleague uh, Arun Sridhar, who uh, heads up disease biology within GSK Bioelectronics, uh, and who will be here with me to answer questions. And I know se several of you have met him as Arun often comes to Case Western, just given the, the fantastic science that is going on here. And we have a number of uh, really important collaborations very much here in Cleveland. So what I hope to do today is I will um, say a few things first about what we at GSK mean by bioelectronic medicines, uh, why it's interesting for us, what, what is this vision. Frankly, why did a, a dark side molecular biologist like me who worked in small and large molecule drug discovery decide to all of a sudden uh, switch allegiance to the electrical impulses? Um, then I'll move on and, and give, give a couple of biological, physiological examples of what we have, with academic collaborators, worked on of late. I, I wanted to anchor this in, in biology, because I think it is, uh, with particularly at case, it, it takes no, no convincing to say that we, we can interface with the nervous system, we can build devices, we can, can impact uh, patients very fundamentally through neuromodulation. But I, what I think is, jointly really interesting is, is saying how do we take that to, to new physiology, new anatomy, and into, into territories where uh, it's been predominantly molecular interventions to have a therapeutic effect, or no intervention because it's lacking therapeutic effect at the moment. <laughs> so, so I want to use a couple of concrete examples. Uh, it's also timely, it's timely because Arun is here. We, we both came from uh, Society for Neuroscience in, in San Diego just yesterday, and there was a symposium there where uh, there were a number of uh, new findings in autonomic control of interesting pathophysiology that was presented. So I'm, I'm going to lift two examples from that, um, just so you get a sense of sort of hot off the press where, where this can be going. Um, then I'll say a few words about what do we see as the big challenges, uh, and we can have a discussion around that. Time permitting, I will I do a light touch of uh, the engineering effort we have uh, in front of us, uh, as well as a few words about the new company that we're launching on Wednesday, Galvani Bioelectronics. Uh, and of course, happy to, to talk about that after the, the seminar as well. But I want to anchor it in, in the science first and foremost. Interrupt me if, if there are pressing questions, and I will also make sure that there will be a good probably 20 minutes at the end here for questions. So uh, why? Why switching from the molecular to the, the electrical? Um, it's, we at GSK, uh, as well as in, you know, many other people and organizations who are involved in the, the area of making therapies, ask ourselves continuously, what are, what are ways to, to link in with biology uh, and ha have a, a therapeutic effect? And, and small molecules has, of course, been a, a, a real um, working horse of uh, 
a therapeutic intervention for 100 plus years. Um, I've heard sometimes medicinal chemists talking about it like, you know, that there was an era when, when, when chemistry was paint and pigments and poisons and so on, and we didn't quite understand chemistry. And then there were some, some, some clever German organic chemists at the, the, the end of the 19th century who, who realized how to tame the, the organic chemistry. And all of a sudden, we had the tools to, to with precision, uh, intervene with biology. A little bit of a simplification, but but there, there's an era when we could tame the small molecules. There's an era when we could tame the large molecules. That, that's what I had an opportunity to cut my research teeth on um, back when I was a PhD student in, in protein engineering, and, and that definitely has unleashed, as we all know, a, a lot of therapeutic intervention. Uh, we we were looking for where we could go next at GSK with the biological and clinical expertise we have, but with a new means of in interacting, and, and landed on, on the nervous system uh, four years ago or so. Uh, why, why are we interested in, in the nervous system? Uh, maybe preaching to the converted here already, but, but I thought one thing that is, is worth the highlighting is we're primarily interested in it because biology is doing it already. Uh, I think the dirty little secret of, of uh, drug discovery or therapeutics is that uh, designing something from scratch is you know, near impossible. And the more you can piggyback on the biology, the better. I, I would argue that why, why did those medicinal chemists, why, why were they successful with small molecules 100 years ago? It is because the body is obviously using small molecules between, uh, between cells, within cells. It is a, a means of control. Uh, antibodies have been a success because they are a means of control. And, and, and we, no matter how clever scientists and engineers we are, we do the last sort of 0.1% in redirecting something that is in biology to, to, to addressing pathophysiology. We felt that if we, in, in modulating neural signals, we can do exactly that. The, the wiring is there, the control of uh, not only uh, lots of voluntary functions, but also a lot of our inner organs are there. Um, and if we can tame that last 0.1%, this is a place we can go to over and over again. Um, so so th that has been the motivation. It is, of course, also something that y you here in, in, in Cleveland and in the, in the field of FES and neuromodulation have shown it's, it's so possible. And I'm not going to dwell on this, but I just wanted to say that not only is neuromodulation proven, by including by m many people in this room, peripheral neuromodulation and controlling, uh, introducing neural signals or blocking neural signals has it's proven, and that's, that's rare. It, 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 we're in this sort of place where it's, it's both a, a, a new field with lots of opportunities and something that is helping patients today. And that is not true, to be honest, when you start looking at where, when you hear about gene therapy and cell therapy and, and um, CRISPR and what have you. I mean, these things have, have great potential. They do not have the advantage of, of what you've been doing here at the FES Center and, and other neuromodulation areas around the world, which actually has taken out, identified the problem, solved problems, brought it to the clinic. So that, that is all uh, the, one, the reason where, why we got excited. Another reason that we, we, we got excited a few years ago is that there, there started to be uh, evidence of affecting diseases that you know, we wouldn't have thought were neurally controlled. And I, I think the example of rheumatoid arthritis is that a company called Setpoint Medical a startup out in um, outside Los Angeles. Uh, it, it, it's a really good ex example of this. Um, here's some early clinical data they put out in 2013, which was about the same time as, as we were ramping up our efforts. Um, normally, as a therapy company, you know, eight patients in a non-controlled trial is not something that you can draw much conclusion of. So, so, so there, there, there are you know, big caveats here. But the, the, the fact, the, the, the promise that they, what they have done here, which is taken patients that have either failed on methotrexate, which is a first line treatment in rheumatoid arthritis, or failed on methotrexate plus several biologics that, that address particular cytokines, um, and, and do quite simple vagus nerve stimulation, and seeing there in, in six out of eight patients that their disease score goes in, in, in one quite clear direction, and 
I've since come out with data showing that when this device is switched off, that the disease comes back, you switch it back on, and the disease comes down. It's quite remarkable. I mean, th th this, this sort of suppression, the level of biological effect that at least these six patients indicate, if this holds true, is the same level of effect that you see with uh, anti-TNFs and anti-IL-6s, so quite sort of you know, big drugs, actually really, really big drugs, helping hundreds and thousands of patients and making billions of revenue in the industry. That is, that is being achieved through new modulation in, 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 in a domain where, at least when you, at the first glance, look at it, you think, well, you know, why is, why is the immune system, what does the immune system and the nervous system you know, have to do with each other? The immune system is supposed to be something autonomous that circles around in our bodies and deals with disease, right? So you see this, and then you ask yourself, okay, if you can do immune system, what, what else can you do? What else can you do with the autonomic nervous system? Um, and that, that was our, our starting point and remains our, our inspiration here over the last few years. Arun and his uh, team of, of brave biologists spend a, a lot of their time uh, looking at maps like this and, and talking to the experts around the world who are interested in different organs here and say, you know what? What pathophysiology do you think you, you can address if, if these nerves are going into this organ? Um, that's all I'm going to say about the vision. There's, of course, a device side of the vision. I'll, I'll come back to that. But what, what the, 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 therapy, the, the therapeutic promise, uh, why we're interested in autonomic nerves, uh, and that we believe that that can be relevant for a lot of diseases, I hope this, this explains. I can just, just to point to some of the things we work on here, respiratory diseases such as asthma, COPD, cardiovascular diseases such as hypertension, arrhythmias, um, heart failure, um, metabolic diseases that I'll, I'll give an example of in type 2 diabetes, there are many intervention points here. Um, inflammatory diseases which go way, way beyond rheumatoid arthritis that I just shown. There, there, are, there are so many different lines you can draw between these organs that are on this, this traditional autonomic chart and disease. So what we have, hmm, see if I can build that, uh, what, what we have <laughs> been involved in the, the, the last three or four years is, is launching into a research effort which uh, has been hugely dependent on, completely dependent on research collaborations with academia. Um, academia and uh, as well as also a number of companies increasingly, but it, it hasn't been a traditional um, we're going to build a research presence within GSK, a company in industry, and we're going to hire scientists, and within our bricks and mortars we're going to build this up. Instead we, we said that look, we, this is a new area for us, we think it, it fits long term in terms of our ability to, to bring biology and clinical translation to bear and bringing treatment to patients. But there's so much we don't know about this. And we don't have patience to, to try to build it in-house. Instead, we want to work with um, experts in, in many different domains and be a, um, a, a valuable integrator and glue and, and sort of discussion partner in that research, um, which is why Aruna spent so much time at CASE. It's, it's something that looks quite night and day versus what um, I think the, the pharmaceutical industry was known for. Um, it's definitely not something that GSK did much 10 years ago. At the moment, GSK probably does 50% of its research it's involved in outside its walls. And for us, it was 95% when we, we, we started this. Um, so I think there are lots of, of, of learnings there of how we can really blur these boundaries between academia and industry that um, you know, the, the, the past uh, errors that have definitely have been made on the, the industry side, uh, which we want to erase and find really productive ways of working. So, so we, we launched into a number of exploratory research projects, um, addressed uh, more than 20 different diseases to get proof of principle, uh, and, and provided uh, funding and sort of, sort of connectivity that I described um, with PIs around the world. We looked at different neural interfacing approaches as well. That, of course, goes hand in hand if you want to show that nerve X is involved in disease Y. Uh, we also launched a venture fund for, to, to help startups who are interested in this space. 
we, we did a, an open innovation crowdsource challenge to get more research tools. Um, and we can see these are sort of exemplars of, of trying to find experimentally where there is traction in this space and how, how we can fit in. Uh, and also with a, an, you know, a, a belief, almost sort of a, a religious belief that if we help unleash something, even if we don't control it, if we help unleash it, then, then by virtue of being in the middle of that, there should, be, there should be benefit for us as well as the researchers we work with. So that, that, that's enough about the approach, I think. And I want to go into two specific disease examples, because just to illustrate the, what I think can be the power here. One I'm going to start is uh, about the, the, the carotid body. Um, it, it is something I've discussed with, with a couple of researchers here at CASE this morning already. Um, you know, it's something that uh, Steve Lewis has, has deep experience in. Uh, uh, I'm going to describe primarily some work that has been done by another really talented group in, in Lisbon in, in Portugal who have looked at the role of insulin sensing in the carotid body on the development of type 2 diabetes. Um, and, and what happens is that the carotid body, uh, primarily known to, to detect uh, the, uh, the oxygen and carbon dioxide levels in the blood and, and react to that, also is uh, detecting likely insulin. There's a bit of a debate if it's insulin or glucose. Uh, the effect is by and large the same. It, it means that it, you get a, uh, an increased signaling when your either glucose levels or insulin levels goes up in the blood, which we know is uh, what happens early on in diabetes, and that seems to be triggering a vicious circle. It leads to higher sympathetic outflow to particular tissues that drives up insulin resistance, and then the insulin levels goes up, and you get a, 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 um, a, a sort of a feed-forward loop is, is the thinking. Uh, uh, Sylvia, the, the, the PI in, in uh, Lisbon had, had discovered this, has characterized it in, to, to a degree in in healthy animals, in, in pre-diabetic animals, and what we started out doing together is said, okay, let's have, let's figure out how, if it is relevant in disease. So uh, she and her lab, they they took um, rats and put them on a high-fat, high-sucrose diet, um, like really quite uh, poor Western diet, if you will, sort of 50% fat, 50% sugar type of uh, diet, um, and not surprisingly, these. Um, these animals de develop many of the hallmarks of early stage type 2 diabetes, including, including insulin resistance. So you see here, animals are on the diet for weeks, and this is their insulin tolerance test. Uh, the lower that value is, the higher their, their uh, insulin resistance. At 14 weeks of, after 14 weeks of diet, the first experiment was simply that, that Sylvia and her team went in and cut the carotid sinus nerve on both sides. Um, and, th and then they did a sham surgery in, in, in this group here. And uh, I mean, this data speaks for itself. It's not really, I don't have to point to what, <laughs> what to look at. The, the insulin uh, sensitivity shot straight up to a level that was the same as pre-diet. Um, and in this experiment, it remained at that level for uh, the 10 more weeks that, that the rats were on diet. Um, so this was... Fascinating result. We also knew that after 10 weeks or so, these nerves were going to grow back, had been seen earlier. We also knew that when you cut the carotid sinus nerve, it, it's not only, um, of course, effect on, on insulin sensitivity and potentially glucose handling, as you see here. It's, we also know that there are signals there for maintaining uh, your, uh, your blood pressure and regulating your blood pressure, and of course, the the, uh, the sensing of oxygen levels and so on that I described before. But, but fascinating early proof of principle. Now, how do we translate this sort of cutting of a nerve then to can we do this reversibly with neuromodulation? This is where, where the sort of uh, uh, expert work that has been done a lot here at CASE, and you know, Kevin and, and, and Niloy and Tina, you, you've been absolutely central in it. People were poring over your papers. They were wondering, how do we do a reversible nerve block? And uh, that was work done both at, at GSK and in Lisbon at our collaborators. Uh, it's very hard to, the, the problem with this, controlling these sort of autonomic things is that your, your, the endpoint that you really care about 
isn't changing immediately. We want, you know, we, we did some nerve cut experiments, and this typically takes a week or so for, for its onset. So you can't try different parameters and wait for your insulin sensitivity a week later and so on. You can, but it's a very long experiment. Sorry. Uh, but what, what the team ended up doing was instead to look at the, uh, the adjacent function, if you will, or overlapping function, which is uh, the sensitivity to uh, hypoxia. So you, 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 um, you expose an animal to, to lower oxygen tension, that leads to uh, faster breathing, and it's the carotid bodies that sense that. These are neural signals that go up the carotid sinus nerve, and, uh, and the team characterized the, the degree of block uh, as well as the degree of onset response at uh, different frequencies, different amplitudes. Um, and I think this, by and large, followed that the sort of patterns that, that were, were first described here at Case. Uh, it's, it's a quite rough calibration, but, but this is it's a sense of trying to let's find a, a stimulation parameter that actually um, uh, at least has a large degree of suppression of the increase in um, number of breaths per minute uh, as a consequence of a hypoxic challenge. And uh, let's find a place where you don't have a big onset response. Uh, the team, um, I think, uh, and then picked the, the parameters all the way out here at 50 kilohertz and 2 milliamps, and then took the um, quite brave jump in, in saying, okay, we're going to do this chronically now in those high fat, high sucrose rats. Um, so we, uh, a combined effort between this and the GSK team went through the surgery of a set of uh, diabetic rats, implanted them bilaterally, and switched on that blocking for a number of weeks. And this is, this is what happened. This is what it, what it looked like. So, so th th these animals have Small cuffs, and these are tiny nerves, by the way. They are, what's that diameter again, Arun? Like 50 microns? 60, 60 microns, 2 millimeters long or something. 1 millimeter, even. I'm exaggerating here. So the, I mean, the, the, these structures are not easy to work with. If we can do it in rats, we can hopefully do it anywhere. Uh, uh, but the, our, our surgeons managed to implant on that, uh, tethered animals with a head cap, um, which the rats are very happy about. Um, which is reassuring. Uh, it, it didn't actually affect their the behavior, including when we switched on the kilohertz frequency block. And uh, you've probably already looked at the chart on the right here. This is sort of results are given away. In, in essence, we could uh, replicate that, that dramatic restoration of insulin sensitivity that you saw from the denervation. So uh, before diet, normal insulin sensitivity, 12 weeks of, of bad diet, you've dropped down to a typical diabetic level. You switch on the block. This is not showing week by week, but within a week, we saw the, the sensitivity come uh, back uh, to, obviously, to, to the same sort of levels that they were before diet. Remember, these animals are still eating the bad diet, by the way. They're still eating 50% fat, 50% uh, sugar, drinking 50% sugar. Um, and then you switch off a block, and it's not a panacea. We haven't cured them, but they're still on the bad diet, which is probably what you would expect, right? And, and, and you see the... Uh, the disease phenotype coming back. Uh, this, this felt, and I'm sure f f for you who, who are working on uh, chronic neuromodulation experiments, this was a, a big win for the team that we got this to work chronically. Uh, I, I had not appreciated when I was a, on the dark side of molecular drug discovery how difficult it is for going from acute to chronic, but this was, um, this was exactly that. So I hope this this little tale, uh, and we'll talk about what, what, what the big tasks ahead are, but I hope this shows you another big chronic disease, I mean big chronic disease, this is type 2 diabetes with 600 million patients around the world, uh, that you'd think that most mechanisms by which you can control it therapeutically or pharmacologically have really been characterized, and yet in, in neuroscience, in neuromodulation, you, you uncover something that has such a dramatic effect on insulin sensitivity. And what I've not shown is that you, of course, then have positive effects on glucose handling, but you also have blood pressure reduction and, and um, a, a number of other things that are important for type 2 uh, medications. Uh, one more example, just to show how neuromodulation can play in a, another uh, drug-dominated um, area, and that is through uh, control of bronchoconstriction in asthma and uh, COPD, smoker's cough. Uh, 
which is, I think again, hundreds of millions of patients. I think 300 million patients around the world or so are suffering from these diseases. Uh, it is known to have a, a big neural mediation component because it's um, uh, antimuscarinics is a mainstay of treatment in particularly COPD, but also has been shown to be effective in asthma. Um, and that is, of course, at, at the end of the parasympathetic etherants that, that, that lead to the uh, constriction of the bronchi. Um, but it's not uh, which come down the, the left and the right vagus, and then, then the pulmonary branches innervate the, the bronchi. Um, it's not optimal to, to do the, uh, use antimuscarinics. It, it, I mean, it's, it's life changing for people with asthma and COPD, asthma in particular, but um, it, it has drawbacks. It, um, firstly, you have to do it in an inhaled fashion. You can't do it. Uh, systemically, because it, 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 uh, there are so many, um, so, so many things that are parasympathetically regulated in the body, right? So you have no therapeutic window there. You inhale these drugs, but you inhale them into obstructed airways. It's a bit of a contradiction, right? You're trying to open up your airways, so you breathe in a drug to try to open up your airways. Um, it's actually quite remarkable that it works, but it, 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 typically before you get your your, your maximum onset, it can be hours before it's actually really dilated things, which is not um, the best way when, when you have an asthma attack. So we were interested to see, can you actually, can you block the neural signals uh, on the nerve before it comes to the airways instead? Uh, and this is work by Brendan Canning and uh, Marion Kollerick at Johns Hopkins. Um, again, someone we've, we've worked closely with in the same sort of fashion that I described here before for Sylvia. Uh, they started ex vivo. Um, and looked at whether they can prevent contra contractions. Uh, so they, they, they induce contractions, and then they again apply uh, either kilohertz frequency or direct current block, block, I think it's kilohertz frequency here for sure. Uh, and they show that these, point to the laser, uh, these um, uh, contractions that you induce, you can uh, almost totally suppress in, um, uh, by applying kilohertz frequency block on the, uh, on the vagus nerve. Uh, and then you try, try it in the, uh, in the reverse fashion, if you will. You, you induce the contraction first and see if you can break it one, while the contraction is on. And, and you can as well. So this is you know, dilated airways. This is constricted airways. And then if you switch on your neuromodulation, your block, you get back. Um, by and large to the baseline where these airways were before. Uh, ex vivo, uh, nice, but obviously not in animal. Uh, in vivo, you get, you get something similar. And interestingly, we man managed to show that you can, you can get the same sort of uh, dilation of the airways in vivo. And the onset of effect there was one order of magnitude faster than, than the drugs. That's actually the onset of effect, one order of magnitude faster than drugs that you just apply to the airway. Um, so the, you didn't even have a challenge of, of getting, having it sort of making it through the bronchi in, in an inhaled fashion. And still, this is an order of magnitude faster, um, which we believe can be a, um, a very powerful way of uh, rapidly providing relief in, uh, in um, asthma and COPD. It's particularly interesting because these airway constrictions are often triggered by by sensory signals from, from uh, the lungs, right? In, in asthma, you, you have an irritant, you have something that then triggers sensory signals, and it goes up to the brainstem, it's going down again, and you, you pull it together. If you, can, if you can beat that, if you can detect the, either the afferent or the efferent signals in a, in a closed loop fashion, you could have a, a on-demand um, bronchodilator that, that is there all the time. Um, so I could go on with many more examples. I'm not going to do that. I just I wanted to, to use these two, and we can come back in, in questions and discussions to, to point out the opportunity and then discuss some of the things that, that we are now facing. So, so we, we work, and we've had these sort of encouraging proof of principle across 10 different diseases or so. That's definitely given us as a, uh, both as a company and as a, I think, broader research community confidence that you can have quite profound effect on pathophysiology. Now comes the difficulty to translating it. And 
and I think there are three areas where I see a lot of um, expertise here in Cleveland. It's really been underlined by discussions I've had this morning, and I see us struggling with at the same time. So I figured I'd, I'd point them out, and we'll see where that can take us. Firstly, okay, fine, we've linked the nerve to a, 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 an organ outcome and a, a disease outcome. Now, how do we understand what's going on? How do we optimize that? How do we sort of understand the interplay between a particular neural circuit, a particular nerve interface, and, and what are the right parameters? That is such a, 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 a complex place to, to, to understand, particularly when you want this to, to work chronically. And we are, in each of these opportunities, now trying to scale up and say, OK, but you, what, what fibers are we exactly trying to address? What, what, what duty cycle do we need? How does that affect biology? Uh, and and it, it's a fascinating area that really links, uh, I think, the, 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 the signals, the, 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 the neural interfaces and the hardware and the designs and architectures and materials and the, the organ physiology. Uh, we are uh, trying to lift that with, with existing research partners, but, but it's, it's not enough. There's mo much more work to do there. Uh, and I think it's something that the FAS Center, having really understood that, how do we, how do we translate an, an intervention to the sort of control we want, uh, the, 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 the expertise that you've built up here over the year can really be brought to bear on these new uh, opportunities. Um, the other thing that uh, I, I ha highlighted to, to you, Ken, and, and it's something that we are facing at the moment is much of the work we've done has been in rats. It's, 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 it's a good start, but we are on the, the difficult journey of now translating that up to, of course, to, to humans. And uh, the variability in anatomy and both, both sort of physical layout and functional anatomy as I think has, um, has made us fairly humble that there's a lot of work to do there. We see a lot of variability between different species. We see a lot of variability within species and particularly we see variability within uh, our species here. You, difference in different patients, difference between the left side and the right side of the body and so on. Understanding that properly um, and therefore knowing uh, how we get to the right neural intervention points in each patient is, is something that we need to see through for all these autonomic nerves. And again, something that I can imagine ha it having been done in, in other settings here in the FAS Center could, is, is ripe for, for work in collaboration. And then, then of course, both the, uh, the, the, the clinical translation, getting this into the clinic is, of, is what we all, or many of us get out of, bed for in the morning. I think we, there's a bit, bit of a um, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde type of uh, thing for, for us having come from uh, molecular drug discovery into this field. On one, one hand, it's hugely promising that you can rapidly get into to, to patients and, and you can try something in, 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 in humans. You, you know, in, in molecular drug discovery, it can take you 10 years and you have to you know, invest so much in optimizing your molecule and doing a whole lot of things before you can get into the clinic. Whereas here you have uh, a real opportunity to take existing hardware, do smart um, configurations and get in and prove your circuit in man before you then together invest that big effort to, to, to make medicines or to, to make the actual device that, that you're going to roll out here. Uh, but on the other hand, it, it, it's a big it's a big leap, right? It's a big leap because you, have, you need a, a surgical intervention. And how do you, how do you, saying it simply, how do you convince, what, what's a, how is it ethical for the first type 2 diabetic patients to have a, 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 you know, a cut down to their carotid sinus nerve on, on two sides of the neck? And, and finding the right ways there around how can we test something interoperatively? Or how can we test something acutely, percutaneously? Are there ways that we can activate the nerve? that, that is, doesn't require an implant? Um, what is the strategy for doing the first experimental medicine study with five patients and so on? That is something we are working through disease by disease at the moment. Um, and again, I, my, my sense is that, that's, uh, that there's deep expertise here in, in, in Cleveland of how to do exactly that. Um, needless to say, it requires really close working between 
the hospital medical school and, and the engineering side of it. Uh, so these are, so are some of the challenges that we are facing. Um, Arun and I would love to talk about these um, after, after the seminar or in the questions. Um, the last five minutes, then we go to Q&A, uh, I'll just rapidly say some things about the sort of devices we want to build here. Because you may well be thinking, that, okay, that's all good and fine. You know, we can address things like type 2 diabetes, but um, how, are they, how is this not going to just be an esoteric treatment for some uh, very extreme severity of a, a chronic disease? The answer is, of course, that well, we have to uh, we have to get to a quite ambitious set of features for these devices, um, and and w what we've set out to do is that we want to have something that is super selective. Um, that, that's part of the problem here versus pharmacotherapy, that you just affect one function of one organ and not the rest, right? So we're trying to be true to that, primarily by, by getting on, on a nerve very close to a particular end organ we want to address. Um, we have the, the long-term ambition of closing the loop. I think that that will make these therapies even stronger and more personalized if you can detect and, and modulate in real time, which, of course, electrical signals allows. And we're really trying to get these devices Small, small, small. Not for the sake of small in itself, but small for the sake of um, minimally invasive surgery, keyhole implantation. Get, getting this to, to be very safely and easily deployed, so that that we are talking about treatments that that you know can be deployed in the district hospital in a, in in, in um, any corner of the world, not not just here in Cleveland and in other areas where you have the expertise, right? which comes to the ambition of, of reaching millions of patients here. Um, there will be a lot of risk and, and jumps we have to take in the device development. Um, it, it's a topic in and of itself. We have, we have chosen to try to move towards miniaturization quickly by, by finding partners who, who are prepared to, uh, to take some risky bets and, and also have, have technology solutions that actually are, have grown up in another world, and, and that's the world of um, consumer electronics, where, where there's, there's been a big push for, of course, uh, miniaturization, miniaturization, low power, wireless um, charging, wireless uh, communication. Um, and m mobile telephony has done it. Internet of Things is really moving a lot of things along. Um, this is a bit of a bet. It, you know, it, 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 the, the, some, many of these technologies have not been brought up with a sort of rigor that is required for, for medical devices. But it, it can, we believe, allow us to, to come off at a, a, a different starting point for the devices that we, we are seeking here for these diseases, and something that we believe we, we ultimately need to do. Um, it's a long journey. And um, this actually shows another slide of what the long journey is in getting to uh, more of a first-in-line treatment as we make these, these interventions smaller and smaller. But I want, to, I want to finish by explaining why we are, uh, day after tomorrow, abandoning GSK Bioelectronics and joining forces between GSK and, and Verily Life Sciences, which is Google's sister company, and form a, a, a joint company called uh, Galvani Bioelectronics. It, it's simply because we realize that this is a, a major effort that now needs to go into building these devices. And we need both a number of game-changing technologies, and we need funding, and we need a commitment that is not just crank out the device in the next year and get it into the clinic, but we, we're going to do this properly, uh, even if this takes 10 years to be able to address these big chronic diseases that, that I described. And that is very much the vision of the company that is launching on, on Wednesday. We, we're bringing uh, our understanding of disease. We're bringing people. We're bringing funding. We're bringing technologies. Uh, we're bringing partnerships into to this uh, company that we are have called Galvani Bioelectronics. Uh, I think actually the name Galvani speaks a little bit for the ambition to the ambition here, right? We want to we wanted to have it be groundbreaking. We want to have it anchored in in good science that that stand uh, the test of time, uh, like hopefully Galvani's uh, little frog legs did. Uh, so, so with that, I will, um, I'll stop, I'll say thank you, and uh, we can open for questions. Thanks.
right, we, we do have time for questions um, before we start. Uh, you will you will need a uh, a nice book for your coffee table in oh. your presidential <laughs> palace in a couple of days. So uh, this will make a nice addition there. Thank you um, ever so much. Thanks, Kevin. Delighted you're welcome. Here, Thanks please. for coming. And um, we are streaming this, so if you would please, if you have questions, I will try to get this microphone to you. Uh, so the floor is open. <coughs> Chris, what's the calculus of um, which indications you're pursuing? Is it an understanding of the biology and, I mean, it's all, it's, yeah. it's all of these things. So how is it weighted? It's understanding of the biology. It's the uh, technological solution. It's mm. the, you know, reimbursement landscape. Yeah. How, how are, what's the, what are the weights on all of these things yeah. to move forward? No, great question. Um, I'm a fundamental believer that if, if, you, if you think too much about the commercial opportunity early on, you, you always go wrong. Now that sounds maybe odd to you for, for someone from business say, saying don't, don't think too much about, about the commercial opportunity. Uh, I, I, I think that there is, there is so much medical need, unmet needs out there. Uh, it's, not, it's not a shortage of opportunity, it's a shortage of um, a, a scientific potential to make a therapy. And, and when you see something scientifically, that's what you should hold on first and foremost. So that's my little preaching. What, what does it mean practically? It means we have looked across big chronic diseases, because why not when, when you enter into a new area? You don't have to start with a, a, a rare disease. But from then on, it's uh, where do we see the biggest uh, jump in treatment effect in, in an animal model? That, that's what primarily has guided us. So you know, where is it going to be something that we we're not sort of uh, improving around the edges, but, but it sort of jumps out from the page. A bit like that type 2 diabetes data that, that I showed before. Right? That, that, that is a, a major effect. So where we see, where we know we're working on a chronic disease and we see a big treatment effect, that, that those are our primary selection areas. Then within that, you, you then do face, um, on the engineering side, what, what is um, technically feasible. Uh, in terms of interfacing power requirements, uh, charging requirements, what have you. And, and some areas uh, may be too stretching for being the first medicine, but we're at least trying and we're kicking the, the tires hard there. Um, what, what is exciting about, for us who work in, in GSK Bioelectronics and who will, will be at, at Galvani is that we're not, we're not tasked with just making one medicine. We're tasked with, with trying to open up a, um, a portfolio or a set, a class of, of treatments, right? So, so encouraged to, uh, to not, uh, to be focused and, you know, go after a few winners, but it's not just go after one treatment. Open it up with a few treatments, have a, um, a, a, a pipeline, if you will, of more treatments that we can bring to bear. A big, big investment here will be in the first, first device solution to the first treatment, and then we very much expect that we can uh, recoup some of that investment for, for the diseases that come thereafter. I hope that gave you a bit of a flavor. Uh, so what's the timeline compared to drug development mm. to first in human trial to the bioelectric approach? So I, I think the first in human, we are um, going to be much faster, uh, particularly when we get the steam up. But already now, you know, from, from idea to in vivo proof of principle in a disease model, we've often gone in 18 to 24 months. And that would be unheard of from a you know, new, new drug target, right, to, to show it in a disease model. Uh, the translation from that sort of the, the rat experiments to um, early clinical experiments can also be accelerated if we use existing devices in the, the best way. I think you can probably get that down to three years or so. Uh, thereafter, it, uh, I don't expect it to move faster, to be honest. Uh, current regulatory environment, you don't have to have as big trials as you do in molecular medicines. But as we move into diseases where you actually compare to molecular medicine, that, that really ought to converge. Um, so I, then you will have potentially uh, four, five, eight years 
quickly as you go through the clinical testing remains to be seen a bit. So uh, I think we can take a few years off that path, but we're still talking, you know, a decade. Um, and, and maybe when you have addressed a number of diseases and can faster move a device from one disease to another, you can, you can train that back. When do you reckon you're going to be hiring? Um, <laughs> I, I don't think you're going to be interested in me. So this is not a, a request for a job. But we're an educational yeah. institution. And what I see you doing here is looking very broadly. Mm. And you're going to need, it seems to me, you're going to need an in-house component yeah. who really understands these devices, yeah. the intricacies, and how they work. And I think that's the talent that yeah. we generate here. Absolutely. So, so when are you going to, be, going to be looking to hire a whole hmm. cadre of uh, people yeah. to tell you how these things really ought to be working? Yeah, no, great question. Uh, so, so first, we, we've, um, just to give you a, a sense of roughly the scale of the undertaking now. So we are currently about 40 people in the GSK Bioelectronics team. We're expanding that to with 10 or so over the next half year. So not, not, not big numbers, but there is a, a core team. There's also a lot of research collaborations, that, as I was alluding to, about 100 people on, in, the, in academia that we're funding at the moment to pursue some of these research strands. Um, and as we kick off the engineering effort in, in building smaller devices, there will be about the same magnitude, so 100 people or so at, uh, at Verily, which is our, one of our parent companies, actually designing and implementing device solutions. So, so the, the one Oster is, right now, there are opportunities. And, and there will be opportunities both at, at Galvani and at, uh, at Verily, um, where some of the engineering will happen. I think in a few years' time, uh, when we hit an, another sort of inflection point, which is a corporate term that always comes up, right? But we, if we call it an inflection point when you see the cease proof of principle that allows you to say, okay, we're going to get into the clinic, we're going to build devices. The next big inflection point is when we're going to have um, the clinical proof in some of these diseases. Uh, then I think we can really go big, because um, that that, that really will uh, confirm the, uh, th that we want to sort of replicate this across more and more diseases. And that might be a good time frame in sort of an educational um, uh, you know, time cadence here, right? So it's think in three to f five years, this is going to probably go from, at least in, in the domain that we're directly involved in, from the, you know, tens of hires a year to something that is going to be one to two orders of magnitude more if we're successful. So hopefully that gives a bit of a flavor. All right. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, so the first target for um, Galvani is diabetes type 2 or yeah, good question. So uh, I, I put up two examples there. We, we, uh, so di diabetes is definitely one area we're interested in. We have um, said that we're going to bring at least three programs into the clinic for parallel clinical uh, testing over the next few years. Uh, and we have 10 or so chronic diseases with proof of principle that, that we're driving forward. Um, so uh, for us at the moment, we don't want to say it has to be this disease. That sort of goes a little bit counter to, to having a, uh, a, a set of, of promising research projects, right? Uh, I would expect that something like a metabolic disease, will, like, like type 2 diabetes, would be in there. Um, definitely interested in, um, in some of the other major domains that I described before in terms of inflammatory and respiratory diseases as well. So uh, that's actually one of the really quite fascinating aspects for, for us in the team, that it, it's not just one shot on, on, on goal here, if you will. Right? We, we can drive forward science in a few domains on the biology and clinical side. And we need to start the device development at the same time. Tricky, 
to be honest, because you have, need to have a modularity and sort of a parallel tracking of device development and, and disease development. And hopefully, if you, you know, if we are here in two years' time, I will be able to say this and this one exactly is what we decided to configure our devices for, and going to be the first chronic uh, clinical proof. <laughs> Last question. So I guess I have a question to follow up on that. As you guys are picking the different diseases that you're targeting, is um, part of the criteria that you're using to pick something where you are most likely to be able to take advantage of the things you listed? You said you want to make things small. You want to have closed closed loop mm -hmm. control. So are you trying to, <clears throat> as you know, yeah. you're going to have so many challenges, pick things where you're going to have less challenges in those specific avenues? Yeah. Great question. We, we, we are to a degree, but not uh, so much that it compromises it being a um, sort of a, a, a step change, a transformation in, in the treatment effect, right? Because you can, you can fall back and say, well, we, we need to do something that is, that is so known and so de-risked that we know we have a first product, that it becomes a, an, an incremental step versus a new modulation approach that is already out there. And, and if we did that, uh, and then we come back to our now two parent companies, the GSK and Tverly, and say, look, we did a slightly better thing. Uh, the, the, then the no one is going to be interested, and patients are not really going to benefit. So, so in this whole equation of, of two new companies coming to the field, it's a, a requirement to go for the sort of big treatment potential in new areas. And, and I think that that's... That is actually to, to, to the whole field's advantage, right? We're not trying to be a late entrant 20, 30 years after Medtronic and, 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 and Boston Scientific and St. Jude and what have you, right? That would be a bit silly. Uh, so we're, we're trying to open up diseases in areas that, that aren't addressed currently and where the sort of timeline that we can pursue with can actually make a difference. All right. Thanks, uh, Chris. Thank